Hello tubes. So cast out evergreen biologist and dark web reasonable one, Brett Weinstein has of late been advocating for what he calls metaphorical truth as a peace bridge of source between the Vulcan-like scientific truths, lowercase, of Sam Harris, and the mythopoetic, read religious revivalist, truth, singular and uppercase, of Jordan, sort your life out, Buck o Peterson. The idea is that religious claims like Jesus is our saviour may be literally false, whilst nevertheless being metaphorically true. What Weinstein means by this is that it may well, to Harris's pleasure, be the case that Jesus is our saviour is a false statement. That Jesus, the grammatical subject, if ever there was such a denotation, does not obey the predicate, is our saviour. At least not in the profound supernatural sense demanded by the biblical literalists. Nevertheless, Weinstein continues, believing that Jesus is our saviour, may have led our ancestors to behave in ways that enabled them in that capacity, facilitating a shared identity of faith that helped keep them alive, healthy and pro-social, and thus up for some fucking and childcare. Jesus might then, according to Weinstein, have been the saviour of the seed, and the proposition Jesus is our saviour is thereby, if only metaphorically, true, potentially placating the Godish Peterson. Unfortunately for Weinstein, this fudge won't do, at least not for anyone who tries to cultivate a proper respect for truth or who's familiar with the American pragmatist's dubious track record on truth. Weinstein would do well to read Cheryl Missack's 2016 book, The Cambridge Pragmatists, in which she tells the story of the relationship between American and English pragmatism. In summary, American pragmatism, the pragmatism of Cambridge, Massachusetts, had two fathers, primarily Charles Sanders Peirce, and subsequently, and much more famously, William James. Unfortunately for the repute of pragmatism, Famous James and his yappy shill, Schiller, were out-and-out -out space cadets, as Russell and Moore were at pains to point out, pretty much annually from 1908 to 1912. Peirce the Obscure, on the other hand, was something of a curate's egg, astonishingly brilliant and groundbreaking in places, arguably still the greatest of American philosophers, whilst in others, usually under the influence of Hegel, being as insane as a sack of bats. Fortunately for the broader programme of pragmatism, the English were at hand, which should always be a great solace to the world. English pragmatism, the pragmatism of Cambridge, Cambridgeshire, has, figuratively speaking, a mother and a son, Victoria Welby and Frank Ramsey, who, one after the other, but via their shared acquaintance with C.K. Ogden, realised that, despite sometimes being difficult and frankly weird, far less famous than James, Peirce was, unlike James, essentially onto something very important indeed. Welby and Ramsey thus in turn set about sorting out the honest naturalist wheat from the flighty idealist chaff an undertaking that Ramsey had pretty much completed before his tragic death, one month short of his 27th birthday. By way of a redemption, this English or Cambridge pragmatism went on to win over Russell and Moore and their immediate analytic successors Wittgenstein and Eyre. It also, amongst other landmarks on the map of Anglophone ideas, helped yield ordinary language philosophy. Game theory, formalised evolutionary psychology, post-positivist epistemology, functionalism and the Canberra plan. Essentially giving us a toolkit which could, were it used, rid us of the continental rot that has so undermined progressive theory, having effectively in its prolix sophistry helped maintain conservative power now for over 50 years. I myself belong to the English tradition, both in my pragmatism and my progressivism. Alas, for Weinstein, English pragmatism, in preserving trifles like, you know, the law of non-contradiction, does not admit truths that are false. Contra the instrumentalist Jamesian bullshit into which Weinstein is apparently taking a long, deep dive, we insist that factual falsehood entails falsehood in every other possible sense. 
That's not to say that we don't, as pragmatists, acknowledge the importance of beliefs. We tend to identify statements of them as truth bearers and the means of verifying them as truth makers. We also, as the founders of post-positivism, openly acknowledge the role of theory in imparting the meaning and interpretive context required for the concept of truth to even make sense in the first place. But what we do not do, unlike Weinstein apparently, is set ourselves adrift and rudderless on the purely instrumentalist catamaran of truth is satisfaction and satisfaction is, you know, like whatever floats, dude. Up with such epistemic fecklessness, we will not put at to hell with famous James or, if need be, profitable Peterson. Consequently, whilst acknowledging that belief in falsehood may be useful, we maintain that no falsehood, whatever its utility, can be true, metaphorically or otherwise. Basically, in addition to Wilfred Seller's assertion that the facts, as determined by our best empirical theories, determine what is the case, and of what is the case that it is the case, the Welby Ramsey reading of Peirce, to which both Sellers and Quine subscribed, asserts that those same facts also exhaust the meaning of the word truth, with no metaphorical remainder. The message then, from the English pragmatists, is stop placating weirdos, Brett. Thank you for listening. If you like this, and hey, you might have, incentivize my arse to make more by dropping a dollar's worth of pennies into my tip jar or on my per video Patreon. Alternatively, validate my existence by subscribing with bell, upvoting or dropping flattery on my comments. Or if you want, come and scream abusively on Twitter, because the pain means I'm not dead yet. Thank you very much.